Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. Go to audibletrial.com slash Rushmore. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Greetings and welcome to the Mount Rushmore Podcast. My name is Jeff, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friends Richard. Hello. And Michael. Howdy. Richard and Michael, they are locked in continual debate about the Mount Rushmore of things, and this week thing is the Mount Rushmore of people who are in way over their heads. Richard, you chose it. Yeah, uh, continuing my uh, my, my running theme of failures, frauds, hoaxes, (laughs) stuff like that. The best people. Yeah. We've been doing a lot of character studies over the last few weeks, I've noticed. Yeah, that's compelling. You know, it's it's very American. It's a very ambitious... Right. We're we're an ambitious country, and all all of my choices, I believe, are American. Are they really? Wow. Yeah, or... Or thereabouts. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's a very American thing to to aim high and sometimes aim way too high. Way too high. Uh, more wise than the Twitter character. Yeah, please. I, then it's going to screw up our Twitter thing because there's like 17 <laughs> A's and five Y's in it. Yeah. So is uh, there are other compelling reasons why you chose this? I don't know. I, there, I think everyone is fascinated by failure to some extent. I know there was the Museum of Failure here in Los Angeles that popped up for a couple of months. I was afraid to see myself in the museum. <laughs> I was so afraid I didn't buy a ticket. It's just a mirror. <laughs> it's just, oh, shit. Oh, no. <laughs> Once you get in, Sucka. you can never get out. Yeah. That's <laughs> your failure. I become floor two <laughs> of the so, museum. So that was it. I, I just think it's something that 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 people are interested in. Particularly people who who attempt something grandiose or try to do something beyond yeah beyond what they're capable of, and sometimes that's where greatness comes in when you reach for the stars and and, and get them. Mm-hmm. But most of the time you don't. Yeah. Most of the time you you fail spectacularly. Yeah, uh, I do think there's something in the uh, identity profile of of uh, the typical American in which there's often somebody standing next to that person saying. Go for it, Larry. Yeah, you got this. <laughs> you got this. Double thumbs up. <laughs> or don't them, let them tell you you can't eat that big old rock over there, you know, or whatever <laughs> stupid thing think it is. Yeah, yeah. There's somebody who maybe they're even in the on the payroll of that person. <laughs> <laughs> Behind every failure is somebody going, "Yeah, you got this. You got this." Uh, so Richard's suggestion, and Michael goes first. Uh, okay, so I have um, kind of not quite four categories this week, but I have like a progression. Oh, from of uh, from aged, okay. age to age to age to age. My first is the character of Josh Baskin from the movie Big. Oh wow! Now uh, the Tom Hanks played Josh Baskin, and uh, everyone's seen this movie, so it's not like you can spoiler spoil, spoil spoiler anything. alert. Mm-hmm. He turns into a, a grown up. He turns into a thirty year old while wishing on like a Zoltan Zoltar. Zoltar machine, some okay. sort of weird, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, uh, carnival fortune-telling, fortune-telling machine. Gadget. Just because he's like embarrassed in front of like this girl that he likes when he's 13 years old and he's too short to ride some sort of ride, yeah. wishes he was big, yada, yada. He turns into a 30-year-old dude. Uh, somehow he figures he has to like survive in the city, get some ridiculous job, and he's actually doing pretty good mm-hmm. for being a 13-turn, 30-year-old in the city. He's... Yeah. You know, he's able to charm his way kind of up the ladder of success um, at the toy company that he mm-hmm. eventually gets hired at. Yeah. He's hired by Robert Loggia, yeah. who just loves him. Well, and everyone loves Robert Loggia, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mutual a, thing. It's mm-hmm. a win-win. Um, but the thing that really comes back to bite him is what he's underprepared for as a 13-year-old is like an adult relationship. Yeah. And I think a lot of teenagers kind of have this feel like they want to get involved in all of these emotions that they're having, but they're really unprepared for yeah. it. At 13, you're, you, you might be able to, you know, design a computer game or play a video game or whatever. Do yeah. all the things that he is able to do in the movie well, but he can't do the thing that ultimately is the reason why he turned big, which is be in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, what I love is that he gets to the point that he literally has to run home crying to mama mm-hmm. uh, yeah. after he's turned, after he's like not quite rejected by the girl, but like he just can't handle all of the, mm-hmm. he's overwhelmed by the emotions of how to do these. How to deal with it. Yeah. yeah. Is uh, the truth that he wants, he wants to go around the problem that he has to go through. And in order to gain those adult skills, you have to go through all those awkward 
yeah, adolescent you, years. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I don't know. You know, he's he's so adept at doing some things, but like the the reason he's there is just yeah. Like, yeah. What do you think his story was after his mom finds him? Does he claim he was abducted by a strange <laughs> man? What does he say? He can't tell the truth. Yeah, he. I mean, he kind of so lives. What does he do? Like from the moment he, you know, he kind of lives just this lie from, you know, mm-hmm. however many months that he's a thirty year old. Yeah, that's actually pretty interesting. Yeah, he must. He must just make up some lie that he has to live for for the rest of his life. Yeah. Wow, mm-hmm. that's pretty messed up. Yeah, I mean, he's. I mean, he's probably already got enough trauma by being a thirteen year old sleeping with a thirty year old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's mm-hmm. weird. Yeah. Um. And then, yeah, then add the fact that he's got to live this life for the rest of his life. And then also that he knows he's going to grow up to look like a young Tom Hanks. Yeah. Throw all, put all that together. That would be Ooh. weird to, to know exactly what you're going to look like. Uh huh. That would be so, that would be very strange. Yeah. Would be very I would look there. exactly the same because I'm youthful. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, Michael, Michael came out of his mom's womb with a, with a little straggly beard. A little straggly beard and glasses. Ouch. <laughs> Okay, uh, so that's uh, interesting. I, I also, for some reason, I didn't expect fictitious characters. Fictional I think that's fine. Characters. I'll allow. All it. right. Okay. All right. Uh, Otherwise, I'd say Michael was in over way over way his head over choices, his head. but I don't think he is. I love those body switch comedies that came out in the eighties and nineties, mm. and they whether they're old and young or um, a mother dad, and a dad daughter. And son. Dad what was and the one son? with? Uh, Vice versa, no. As Judge Reinhold and uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm not Arnold. surprised that Judge Reinhold was in a body switch comedy. Yeah, uh, Dudley Moore and Kirk Cameron. Kirk Cameron. They, oh uh, yeah. Uh, who knows what that one's called? They're all the same. Mm-hmm. I, what do you learn? Do you learn a lesson by living in someone else's body? You must. Got to walk a mile in their shoes, even it, if it's Dudley Moore and one of them's club footed. <laughs> <laughs> that must be weird to jump into Does he have for a Kirk, club foot. He had a club foot. <laughs> oh God bless him. For Kirk Cameron to jump into Dudley Moore's body and have like bigger feet than his dad. <laughs> Yeah. I was be like, whoa, hey, what's going on? Uh, did the funny, I think, was it John Lovitz who was his coworker or something? Mm-hmm. And John Lovitz was saying, you know, look out for her. She's going to yada, yada, yada to you. And uh, some kind of sexual encounter yeah. that uh, um, uh, Tom Hanks' character wasn't uh, prepared to hear. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it does bring into sharp contrast how bizarre it is to be an adult and how daily you encounter you have interactions and things like that that you would have never imagined as a kid and they're entirely ridiculous i yeah. like i think of like strange adult interactions that i like shy away from at work like like all of them <laughs> oh, God, that's pretty I, much all that pretty much me right there <laughs> but like good morning michael what does she want from me i didn't do it <laughs> i didn't do it i, didn't do it. <laughs> I just mean like you really have to learn when to like stay out of a conversation yeah like there, and there's so many people at work. Maybe I'm just not super friendly at work, but there's so many people at work that are just like they want to get involved in your life or know so much about your life, and so much about being an adult seems to be like learning just how much to yeah. actually give. Them. Oh yeah, yeah yeah yeah. Don't overshare. All right, uh, Richard. All right. So my first one, Carl Lewis, is a uh, the cer- runner. The, the certainly the not out of his depths when it comes to track and field. Okay. He won four gold medals at the 84 Olympics and a bunch more. This sounds like an ad for sprinting like and Pepsi. long jumping. Carl after Lewis. That. Not out of his depth. But you know what he's not very good at? What's that? Singing the damn national anthem. <laughs> oh, uh, wow. He was, this, this I thought was relevant uh, with the recent Fergie bombing the national anthem at the NBA All Star game hmm. a couple of few weeks ago. Um, he was, uh, came on to uh, do the national anthem in, during the 93 NBA finals in Houston. He's a Houston native. Um, and he's, they offered it to him. And he said, yeah, sure. I'll do it. I mean, how bad could it possibly go? Oh, 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 say, can you see? And the rockets, red flag. Uh-oh. I'll make up for it now. For the land of the free. How, when did this occur in his... Uh... 1993, so right okay. at the end of his, uh, his sporting excellence. Okay. Um, so as... Obviously, it did not go very well. He uh, claimed later on that he had somehow gotten, he had a cold and couldn't oh. back out of it. Yeah. Good rule of thumb. If you're not a professional singer and you get a cold and you're supposed to sing in front of thousands of people, 
back out. Back out of it. Yeah. You're fine. They can f- they can find another singer. There yeah. there is a the, janitor yeah. that can sing the hell out of the national yeah. anthem that's mopping up in. Mm-hmm. Do you think he suffers from the what we claimed earlier is that around somebody who's achieved a certain amount of celebrity, there's often somebody next to him saying, yeah, go do that. Somebody had to be. I mean, yeah. he, he came out with like a, a R&B album in 1987. Oh, he did? Called Break... And the, remember, this, the main song was Break It Up. Oh. I, I urge you guys to go watch the music video. Okay. It is one of the worst music videos ever. Is it ever. about gangs or something like that? No, no, no. It's just really no. bad. It's, <laughs> it's just a, particularly bad. It's the Three Stooges. Uh, he's playing Mo from the Three Stooges. Ooh. It's Break really, it up, you wise guys. Uh, yeah. Oh. Um, no, I think there's an element of that. Somebody had to be telling him, yeah, you're like a really good singer, man. I can't believe somebody who's so talented do so many different things. Yeah. He's someone who thought he was a multi-hyphenate. Yeah. To reference one of our past episodes. In fact, was just non-hyphenate. Oh. Uh, that's uh, that's an interesting. Like, I think that the... I think the national anthem is something that doesn't... it. Yes, it requires you to be able to sing if you want to be able to perform it well. But I think it's also just like an honor to be asked. And I think it's one of those things where, like, you know, you've seen... I think when you are a 30-something-year-old man and you've seen little girls go up and sing the national anthem, I'm sure, in front of track meets and in front of... From every every walk of life, someone has sung the national anthem in some way or another. I can understand the impulse to do it, not because you think you're a great singer... Right, but to do it just because of the the honor of it, right? Mm-hmm. I guess, but it didn't sound very. The good. venue it's, of this giant stadium, there. yeah, it, it's it's bad. You can you can tell as soon as he hits that one note, it's like whoa, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> and then you're stuck with it, right? That's one of the things about getting in over your head. Yeah, is it's one thing if you're in over your your head in a situation where you can go, you know what, I'm going to walk away from this. I've already screwed this up enough. It's you know. Time to move on, you know, Mm -hmm. die another day. Yeah. You know, in that situation, you can't just stop in the middle of the song and go, hey, guys, you know what? It's not working for me. Can we get a, go to the bullpen, bring in a, (laughs) bring in a pinch singer here? You're kind of stuck at that point. That's got to be, that's got to be an Adam Sandler movie, The Pinch Singer. He comes out and uh, just finishes finish. up. So he just does his opera. And the land of the free. He sings clean up. I sing clean up for the singer. Uh, what I find interesting about this topic is uh, the idea that um, we reward those people who succeed and we kind of laugh at those people who fall short of their goal. Elon Musk sent his reusable heavy rocket or whatever the thing is with a car in it yeah. send it out into space think if that didn't go well think if that thing blew up and then he reminded everybody my car was in that thing he would seem like the world's biggest fucking idiot <laughs> right. but instead he just seemed like the biggest baller on the planet like he's a wizard who walks among us what's crazy is he would have just sent up two cars the next time he, yeah like he i don't think that i i think some people like that that are so so sure of themselves like uh-huh. i think that they there is no stomping them it's uh, just like oh well yeah okay it didn't work yeah well we'll just what do two cars next time everybody two I yeah can put two, two cars. cars on there yeah. okay that's fine yeah put, and, a, put an suv on there and he's probably say you've forgotten all the mistakes that i made already because i've mm. made thousands of them that's how i got to this this success okay michael you're second uh i'm still sticking in a fictional movie universe oh, okay. okay um the character of clark kellogg from the 1990 movie, The Freshman. Unique. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so he plays, uh, Matthew Broderick plays this character named Clark Kellogg, who is a film student attending NYU. He steps off like the train station at Union Station mm-hmm. and is immediately kind of like taken advantage of by Bruno Kirby, the yeah. this character played by Bruno Kirby, who ends up. You know, he trusts him for two seconds because he's like, oh, you know, oh, you're so smart. And he's like, I can give you a dis- dis- discount to, on the ride into the city, yada, yada, yeah. yada. He steals all his stuff. Eventually, somehow, he manages to catch up with Bruno Kirby and confronts him. And uh, he introduces the Matthew Broderick character to this guy that looks exactly like the Godfather, yeah. like Vito Corleone. Yeah. And it's played by... Um, Marlon Brando. By Marlon Brando. Yeah. Uh in like this caricature. And I love the idea. And so, and he gets like, like he kind of gets talked into being a part of the mob. 
kind of, and working for him, doing odd jobs yeah. for him, like transporting, you know, live Komodo dragons yeah. uh, to an exotic uh, uh, pop-up food service mm-hmm. for rich people to pay $500,000 to eat these, you know, yeah. extinct animals. Um, but I love the idea of someone who is going to college. They're so inexperienced, mm-hmm. but you think you're so, but you think going into college, you think you can do it all. Yeah. You're like an adult by, you know, by age, but you can just get as flustered and yeah. as taken advantage of. And uh, uh, th- this was just a fun movie. And I loved like him constantly like being kind of weirdly bamboozled by these fake mob people. They yeah. might be pop people. They might not be. Right. But I don't know. I was just, uh, w- when I was kind of thinking along the lines of this guy that is suddenly, you know, oh, to a day into his going to college experience, he's mm-hmm. attached to the mob. Yeah. I, I realize we're evaluating this character and the story about this individual who's overwhelmed in a situation, but is it also kind of meta and he, it, it, this world knows about the Godfather. They, they, yes. Okay. Like he's a film student. He's like, you look exactly like, and he, you know, he always interrupts him. Yeah. yeah he's like, yeah. well, you, you, uh, that is like the Godfather was based on me. Yeah. He's yeah. like, I, that's, they wrote, yeah. it, they wrote it about me basically. He yeah. Just does the walnut crushing thing and he's, yeah. he's, you know, this big presence. I think there's something of uh, Matthew Broderick's inherent um, goodness and naivete mm-hmm. that he brings with that character um, that is so believable. And so, especially when you see him being strung along by, by this character, it's so fun to see him being strung along. I, how, how old was he when that movie came out? He was not a freshman. No. It's 1998. What was, uh, we talked about War Games a couple of weeks ago, and that was, what, 84? And he was probably 14, 16. 16. So he was probably... I thought he'd been playing grown-ups for a while. Yeah. He, yeah. Maybe he was probably 22. So maybe he was playing close to, you know, being 18 years old. I think so. I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked up his... Uh, mm-hmm. You don't know his. Uh, you don't know his IMDb page by. I do by heart. not. I do not know. Looking at it, that's 1990. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, 50, when... he's born in 62, so he's okay. 28. 28. All right. Yeah. A little long in the tooth for that, there, uh, Maddie. Uh, sure. I guess so. <laughs> I'm fascinated I mean, by when. Do you ever like due to the sequencing that movies, films are released? Somebody who's 20 something might play a teenager in one movie, then an adult. In the next movie. Right. And then, like, Lindsay Lohan had, like, a couple years where she was, like, the kid at home or the young working girl out on their career. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, young yeah. Working, working girl. Working but girl. Richard, what's your second? All right, my, my second. Tr- By the way, Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. Michael Brown, the head of FEMA during Katrina. Oh, okay, yeah. This fucking guy. <laughs> this guy is, like, the, 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 uh, we, we. With Trump, we've kind of reestablished new parameters for yeah. failure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But this guy was a fuck up yeah. of, in the first order and directly was responsible for, I don't know, how many deaths probably because of his incompetence? Mm. Dozens. I, I, a lot. Okay. You know, he was a former head of an Arabian ho- horse association who got uh, picked to be general counsel of FEMA by his college buddy. Oh wow! Then when his college buddy left, he got to take over FEMA. Mm-hmm. He had no, no real credentials to be doing anything yeah. like this. And uh, the first uh, first major catastrophe he dealt with was the last one he dealt with. That's the first uh, credential of the Trump presidency. Any sort of candidate, you have to have no credentials. Yeah, true. Yeah, horses. And if you know horses, even better. Yeah, I think Ivanka really mm-hmm. likes horses. Mm-hmm. Um, things like. Doing a press conference and then immediately emailing his staff to let him know, let them know that he looks how good he looked in his new suit and that he looked like a fashion god. Oh my god! Um, things like <laughs> things like uh, having people tell him in emails how bad the situation was at the Superdome and tell him there's no food and water, and his response is, "Well, oh, thanks for the update. Anything specific I need to tweak?" Like, you know, like you're being like emailed about, yeah. hey, we're having, you know, we got a little bit of problems here, Jeff, with this one, uh, yeah, this one, uh, you know, PowerPoint that you're working on. Yeah. I can tweak, you need to give a little yeah. tweak to that. Some tweaks. Yeah, some yeah. tweaks to thousands of people. Well, you know, it's like a, a, 
a, a potato salad recipe or something. Yeah. yeah. I think what happens with a lot of like department heads and agencies like that, so much of that is figureheadedness and uh, you rely so much on like your kind of underlings to do the work. So, uh, I'm not defending him, but like, I, I bet a lot of these guys and gals get into like this mindset of like, I just oversee the things that are happening. As long as the things that are happening are happening, everything's fine. Yeah. But then obviously with the, the total breakdown <laughs> right. mm-hmm. and no direction and leaderlessness, it's it's interesting to think of like government agencies really needing a strong leader to, you know, the, the just, government kind of operates on its own for the most part. Mm-hmm. And if you take, but but for like big if some crisis piece, things, If some piece breaks in the system, yeah. like it can operate on its own through like normal operations, right? Like, like, like even if things are broken within it, mm-hmm. more or less, it'll sort of like heal itself. Yeah. It takes care of itself to some degree. Yeah. But once things break down and you've got the head of FEMA emailing his director of public affairs saying, can I quit now? Can I come home? That was the day of the hurricane. Mm-hmm. That is, that is his attempt. That's that let that's leadership. Yeah. Leadership is not telling people that you work for. I really want to quit. This is really hard. Um, and then famously, he was on an interview with CNN and didn't know that thousands of people had been moved to the convention center, even though it had been reported nonstop in the news for the last 24 hours. Mm. Wow. Did he get fired? Oh. Was he, he was, he, did he stay he, on he, in another capacity? Or? He resigned. Okay. I'm sure he resigned on his own accord and nobody told him to, to take a hike or anything like that. Am I resigned? <laughs> Sets an email and bounces back. Can I resign now? Question mark. And, of course, led to one of the, I guess, two most infamous statements of the uh, George W. Bush administration, that and Mission Accomplice. Yeah. Yeah, just this guy. Mm-hmm. I, 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 You can tell I'm getting, like, physically upset yeah. a little bit thinking about this guy. It just how, drives me so bonkers that, like... How far has he failed upwards right now? Like, he must be running... Something. Well, you know, the thing is... He must be doing well, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. You know, I hate to... You hate to wish... Well, I don't hate to wish bad on this guy. Wish bad on this guy. Him. Please, fuck this guy. Um, that Every once in a while, like when a, like when the hurricanes in Puerto Rico or Houston hit, you'll see him being, like, like interviewed, like, what do you think of the response, crisis response that's happening? And I just want him to go, well, it's a fuck a lot better than I did. Yeah. For, like, every one for of everything. them. For everything. Every interview should start with, well, you screwed this up royally. What mm-hmm. do you think they're doing better? Mm-hmm. That should be the question he should have to answer for, like, all of eternity. Yeah. Do you think the guy was prepared? Do you think they you, you can have the kind of knowledge? Like, you obviously can, like, do drills. You can do analysis. You can run um, uh, virtual emergencies and see if you're ready to do that. Um, you know, sometimes the people like emergency workers, uh, uh, fi- fire workers, a- ask the city for um, funds to do debris removal and tear out old dead wood and stuff like that. And nope, they never get it. Yeah, I, well, I think that that would work. You know, like the great shakeout type thing, or whenever they do the disaster drill, like at your office, mm-hmm. or even in a bigger scale. You know, when it's the people who are on the ground. They take that seriously. Yeah. Like, but you can't, I don't know, can you really train the head of the of FEMA uh-huh. to like not run around with a, like a chicken with his head cut off when <laughs> the thing actually happens? I don't, I don't think yeah. you can train that. Yeah. I don't think there's a course on the lynda.com course <laughs> on that. That'd be so great. The great masters. The great- uh, Ron Howard teaches emergency management. <laughs> um, okay, guys. So we are at our halftime, if I'm not mistaken. And I would like to implore you to support all the cool podcasts out there. There's those top, top uh, categories that you can find on iTunes. And it's always going to be the Joe Grogan thing or something from Fresh Air or some kind of NPR thing or something. But, you know, there's some underdogs out there, some up-and-coming podcasts, and we support them at the Mount Rushmore Podcast, and we want you to support them as well. And here's a promo from one of them. Trivia Geeks, the Unpredictable Game Show podcast is back with a brand new season. They've got a new host, new games, and a new day in time. But that's not all. Now you can download their companion app, Triv Now, and play along in real time. Watch Carrie on YouTube as she tries to convince her partner that his dark night hasn't risen in years. Listen on Diamond Club and Alpha Geek Radio, Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Twitter and get all the latest updates and showtimes. 
And we're back. You know what? Uh, you've given your support to podcasting, and I want to give something to you. For you, the listeners of Mount Rushmore Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their services. Uh, you can, if you want to learn how to not be overwhelmed, you can read or listen to Overwhelmed, How to Quiet the Chaos and Restore Your Sanity by Kathy Lip and Sherry Gregory. Those seem like a couple of great gals you want to spend time with. That is on Audible with 180,000 other titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, or Rio. Remember the Rio? Oh, yeah. I think I had one. Yeah. Or Zune. Can you play it on your Zune? Um, To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Rushmore. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Rushmore for your free audiobook. And please go to Facebook and go to our site, our page on Facebook, um, where you can suggest topics. You can see live streams that we have done, and you see our beautiful, handsome faces, and you get the dialogue about topics that you'd love to uh, see us debate, hear us debate. You can go to Instagram. You can go to Twitter. And these are all places to get in the dialogue. We'd love to hear from you, and we would love to uh, have you rate us five stars on iTunes. Or more. Yes, break the five that? star stranglehold. Barrier. Yeah. yeah, the stranglehold, like the 300 in bowling. It's artificial. You why not bowl a 400? Why not bowl a 400? <laughs> Do it. Uh, go to Stitcher if you want to. I think they probably have ratings or something like that. I don't know what the heck that is. Uh, and we would love to find out what you think. And the more you support us, the more other people can find us. And that makes uh, good things uh, for everybody. And maybe Michael and Richard's kids could go to college. Nah. Uh, junior college. Junior college. Junior college. Trade school. Okay. We is back, and Michael is telling us his third. Uh, my third is, so, first character was a uh, teenager. Second one, going off to college. Third character. Mm-hmm. Fresh out of college. Getting that first big job. Norval Barnes. From the Headsucker Proxy. Oh, fun. oh, good, fun. Yeah, good times. Uh, Tim Robbins plays a character who's kind of like just this dopey, wide-eyed yeah. kid from Muncie, Indiana, who gets a job in like the mailroom at Hudsucker Industries. Mm-hmm. I think it's either on the day of or close to the day that Mister Hudsucker decides to kill himself by jumping out the window. Yeah, <laughs> take take a little flight. Um, and so at some point, so he is tasked to bring up what is called a blue letter to Mr. Musburger, the new CEO that's kind of secretly planning to take over Hudsucker Industries on his own. Yeah. Um, Because the stock is starting to fall, but he realizes that he needs a patsy, a pawn, to put in place yeah. as the new president or CEO or some, you know, the, the highest... The big cheese. The big cheese. The kahuna. And he, he sees this dopey Norval Barnes character mm-hmm. and... uh knows right away that this is the person that obviously is going to help drive the stocks as low as they possibly can go so he can buy them all up and take over the company himself. Yeah. Uh, what he doesn't know is that uh, Norval Barnes has a really big idea, which is a drawing of a circle. Yeah. You know, for kids. You know, for kids. For kids. Yeah. For kids. And um, it ends up being a hula hoop, and that ends up making Hudsucker Industries tons of money, skyrocketing this dope to... <laughs> like prominence within the company. And um, he gets such a big head from this. From He doesn't realize, obviously, that he's being manipulated. Sure. He's just this idiot. But he thinks that he's doing a great job. Is he an idiot savant or just an idiot who had a good idea? I think he's an idiot with just a good idea. Okay. Which, you know, they're a dime a dozen and you can see, you see them all the time on like Shark Tank. Yeah. When these people come on, they have like these weird stories and they've been working for 12 years on... Mm-hmm. Their, their invention, the and DVD rewinders, their MacGuffin that does a thingamajig, and then yeah. you know you sell four hundred million of them at like a Home Depot. Hi right. sharks, uh, I'm looking for a five million dollar investment for five percent of my idea, <laughs> the Colonel mm-hmm. Recobber. Okay, okay, so I'm intrigued. You've okay, taken the more. corn off the cob. Now you've got this empty cob, but you don't want to eat all the corn. Well, where do you put it? Wait, here's here's my you daughter put it back that on the cob. in from the back. <laughs> yeah, who like. Oh, this is Trixie. Yeah. Dressed up like a big corn on the cob. Yeah. Isn't she cute? 
<laughs> Look how she doesn't Aww. know how to put the corn on the cob herself. Oh, uh, the thing won't go on, and now I got <laughs> kernels everywhere. Uh, you know what? Somebody, oh, a good friend of mine has an acquaintance who was on the show, and he said they do both endings. They tape a, we love your idea, we'll buy it ending. And they tape a, your idea sucks, go fuck yourself ending. Ooh, oh, really? really? Yeah. Oosh. Yeah. Or maybe they just did that with him. Oh, <laughs> even better. <laughs> That's a know. real shark tank right there. <laughs> okay, so uh, he's to, the patsy. Yeah. He's this naif yes. who's, yeah. He doesn't realize how in over, he had his, in over his head he is at this mm-hmm. company. He doesn't realize that uh, they can take it away, and they do take it away in an instant. Yeah, they end up like committing him to like an insane asylum based on nothing. They drive him to the point where he's going to commit suicide, and he jumps out the yeah. out the window himself at the top. Or maybe he's does he fight someone at the top? It's been a while since I watched. It. I'm trying to think. I know that there's like a a clock t- caretaker who basically acts as like his guardian angel of sorts, right? And then. You know, it's a Coen Brothers movie, and they do a weird thing with time stopping. Yeah, time really. stops. Jennifer Jason Lee's accent just sort of like breaks time. Oh, <laughs> she has no the bond. Ah, I'm doing see, Gene yeah. Arthur. I'm Gene Arthur and Catherine Hepburn. She has the most 1940s dame accent yeah, in that yeah. movie. Uh, and it, uh, what's his name has a weird role in that too. Uh, Campbell. Paul Newman. Paul Newman. Bruce no, Campbell. Paul Newman. Bruce Campbell has like yeah. a, a weird, strange kind of like. Oh yeah, Paul uh, Bruce Campbell's in things other than Army of Darkness. Yeah, well, it's weird to see him out it's, of that it's character. It's the same right. Raimi and uh, Cohen connection. Yes, yeah. he wrote that. Yeah, um, I, that's right. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, do do you were you a fan of the films that this was an homage to, like the Capra? No type films. No, no, like, no. Okay, okay, I was. I, yeah, I I felt it was clearly a tip of the hat to those which are dis- explorations of the American character. Oh, like you know, a like, Sullivan's Travels or something yeah, like that. Or like Mr. Deeds or Mr. Smith or It's a Wonderful Life or these things where the hero, what is heroic is not revealed until the last reel of the movie, where the the thing that makes this person uniquely American is not, um, they don't fight for their own um, reputation until the last 20 minutes. And then right. they have this impassioned speech that mm-hmm. only Jimmy Stewart and only Gary Cooper or can 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 do, and it seems like in this movie too, he's he's maligned and used and manipulated until that last moment where somebody helps helps him help himself. Right. So, yeah. I ask you that about it whether he's an idiot or an idiot savant because that's the idiot savant is kind of a character in a lot of it's a trope. Mm. You know the the Peter Sellers and being there type mm-hmm. character who is sort of the simpleton who happens to be really almost like good at this one thing or sort of. It's almost like the Forrest Gump thing, right? Right. right. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, like where, where he kind of backs his way into success. Success. And I, I and so I was wondering if that's another kind of thread that goes to that a little bit. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I, I guess so. I mean, it, you know, the kicker at the end of the movie is that he has another brilliant idea, which is also just a circle drawn on a page, and it ends yeah. up being the frisbee. The frisbee, yeah, right. Uh, like the the, the dingus. <laughs> The, the the accidental brilliance mm-hmm. I think is uh, just super charming. Yeah, I he kind you know it's 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 a guy that you wonder maybe did he learn his lesson at the end of it? Mm-hmm. Is he just going to get suckered into another another scheme or something yeah. else and get over his head that way? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, Yankee Doodle went to London just to ride the ponies. Put a feather in my cap and called it Jackaroni. President Goulet? Uh, hello. <laughs> I think he's Canadian. Hello. I don't think he even has president. Hey, guys. What's up? What's up, fuckers? It's me, Ben Franklin. Hey, uh, Mr. Franklin, you're yeah. not... Yeah, pleasure to see you, but... Yeah, pleasure I to be seen. I, I got a lot of shit to do, you guys, so come on, ex- let's get this didn't up. didn't expect to see you in the Rushmore thing. I don't know if you... What's that? The Rushmore no, thing. Man. It's, you're yeah. not a president. Oh, fuck, come on. I think he was I born in Europe, too. Guys. I, I made all those guys president. Come okay. on. Jeez, come on. Thomas Jefferson? TJ, you would have made that whole thing. Freaking Declaration of Independence would have been so boring, right? Without me just putting some fun jokes and some things inside there. But no, guys. So seriously, I'm so fucking busy right now. Okay, okay. I got uh, I got to pick up some cash uh, for a patent on my my Franklin stove. There's all these batteries that I invented. 
Um, I, I'm the colonial agent for Georgia, colonial agent for New Jersey, colonial agent for Massachusetts. It's life insurance? Do you run the Franklin Mint? I run the Franklin <laughs> Mint. I love, I love, I love your commemorative. Franklin plates. from Peanuts. I put the Is that dirt. You? I put the dirt on that guy. I, I invented the glass harmonica. I, uh, I, I. Invented the library, invented like hospitals. This guy and invented like reading a Wikipedia page. Is what he <laughs> <Yeah>. did. <laughs> but you know, I got it. I got this. I'm not overwhelmed at all. There's okay. no way. I got this really under control. Other than just this itch in my crotch. Yeah. Oh God. Ah. So you, you know, invented this thing called penicillin, you, Mr. Franklin? What is it? How do you spell penicillin? that? Penicillin. Oh, shit. Uh, okay. Did you invent that? I don't think you, no, that's one you didn't get that to. That sounds correct. so. If you go to Paris and just hang out with the. Uh, uh, if you would just yank your doodle, yeah, that's that's <laughs> does sound like a French courty courtesan, you know. Yeah, Miss yeah. Penicillin. That's right. But it's, just, a, it's a medicine you might want to just look into. Okay, that. well, yeah, okay, I'll I'll do that. And you know, good luck with whatever this thing you guys are doing. Yeah, we're kind of in over our heads with it, so yeah. I appreciate you coming in and and, and adding some sure no problem. Competence to I'm gonna it. leave you with some tips. Early to bed, early to rise. Fuck you, bitches. <laughs> hey guys, what's up? Uh, we were visited by a non a non president. What's that? A non president. What's that? Is that person's not a president? Oh, he's a president. A non? That'll be later. No, oh, he's not a president. Oh, he's at not. All. Oh, not a president. Not a president. Non president. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, like got one of those there. time travel things. <laughs> it's Ben Franklin. Oh shit! Really? Yeah. I'm going to talk about how much how much how much paying he gets when he took off. I don't know. French, it's weird. Which French pune he's got? Well, fuck. I'll. I'm sorry, I missed him. Yeah, I, I, he was speaking into your mic. You might want to be careful. Oh, you yeah. may have some sort of Ugh. like mouth herpy Ugh, thing God. going on. Okay. Uh, so, Richard, what's your third? So, when the, Acad- the the Motion Picture Academy in 2011 decided, we need to hip this thing up, oh, you yeah. know, for the kids. For the kids. <laughs> so, let's get Anne Hathaway. The kids love her. She's in one of those big movies that people love, right? Yeah. Sure, whatever. The Princess Princess. Or, yeah, some, yeah, some, 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 the Princess Bride. Devil, Devil no, Wars not Princess. that one. Yeah. But the kids love her. Oh, you know who they really love is that James Franco. Oh, yeah, yeah. That guy, he's... He's a surefire bet, that guy. Yeah, you know, that guy's a ball of energy. Yeah. I can't imagine how this could possibly go yeah. wrong. He's anything but consistent all the time. <laughs> he's consistently inconsistent, yeah. yes. This, if I remember watching this and... and you could just see the moment in Anne Hathaway's face where she realized, oh, crap, I'm going to have to carry this all by myself. And, and and she responded to that, but like flailing around like a middle schooler in a production of Wizard of Oz playing Dorothy when she realizes that the cowardly lion like has forgotten all his lines. That's essentially what happened mm-hmm. here. Um, I, it felt like James Franco was, I don't know if he was doing a, a performance art bit. Mm-hmm. Like some sort of like Andy Kaufman yeah, sort of like, like a Joaquin Phoenix. Thing. Yeah, I'm so, not yeah. there sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. Or if, or if he knew it was going to go badly, so he just decided to detach himself mm-hmm. from it so much. I feel that like he, he's done that in whole films. I felt like he was that in the Great and the Powerful Oz. He was right. Like, oh, we got to get back to the Emerald City. That's what. <laughs> that's sort of his like. Uh, but that's sort of his his hallmark, right? Is phoning it in the phoning it in the underplayed kind of under low low energy kind of. And then I'm, once every 10 movies coming out and just being like, whoa, yeah, where the hell did that come from? Yeah, yeah. And then 10 more like terrible art house, <laughs> like $20,000 budget film. That's, that's, a, that's a fascinating thing because like from interviews I've heard with James Franco, he has, I think, didn't he go to NYU and he took like five it classes was, at it the was same while, time? It was, yeah, he was in the middle of that while he was while he's trying to the do the Oscars. <laughs> and that's Bruce Valanche actually said. I'm not going to do Bruce Lee voice, yeah. but he, he said that like, like, yeah, he was basically flying it back and forth and doing classes, at U, teaching classes at UCLA and taking classes at NYU. Yeah. And he just wasn't there. Yeah. And he, I think he thought it was something he could just sort of like, like Bob Hope. Right. Just kind of fly in the day of the show. The writers got the uh-huh. lines for him. Not Bob Hope. James Franco. Not yeah. Bob Hope. <laughs> not, not Bob. Not Bob. Not Bob. That's a very interesting choice. Uh, do you... I don't remember a single thing from like that Oscars. Yeah, there's so many that I don't remember nowadays. I, I remember they used to be like no offense to Oscars and the award show in general. Oh, they're listening. Like, like oh, Ooh. after our last, our, no, that's our future guest. Um, oh, you, it's not like the show's a, the, fault. The, yeah. The, yeah, like you know the Billy Crystal bits. I remember, but maybe that's just because there's like an area of your brain that's like things are so etched in stone from when you're like. 
14. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just like, oh, I, you know, I remember all, you know, oh, it was so, but like, I'll be, like for 20 years, I don't remember a damn thing. Mm-hmm. The only thing I remember from the James Franco year, other other than him just, all right, so our next act. He kind of sounded like Lorenzo Music a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they the crawled doorman, into yeah. doorman yeah. slash Garfield. <laughs> Um, is they did some sort of black as the Black Swan year. They did some sort of bit where Anne Hathaway was dressed up like the Black Swan, and James Franco was like in a tight unitard without a codpiece. Mm-hmm. That was the comedy. Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, that did not go so well. There's something about being young and beautiful and having uh, the boy the entertainment there. world. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like like comedy has always been the bailiwick of the underdog. The, right, the ugly underdog. Right, that having these two young, glamorous people um, be the hosts it just is it never sits well because like they could they could do a turn and go grab an Oscar for some performance or something. Right, Johnny oh. Carson could never do that. Or I mean, Let, you knew Letterman wasn't going to do. that. They'd both done like Saturday Night Live and done a good job on that, but it's yeah. such a very different sort of beast, right? Like to be on Saturday Night Live, which I'm sure is incredibly difficult as a host, but you've got maybe three or four sketches to learn. And as long as they're written well, you're going to be okay. Yeah. The Oscars, you got to be able to carry, you have to carry the, you have to carry sort of the, what you have to say more than what you have to say carries you. Yeah. I just think they don't have the gravitas for it or there's, there's Mm. something about that person who they weren't alive when (laughs) the Oscars were. (laughs) Well, Skeet Ulrich was their first choice. (laughs) He turned them down. So Uh, what's your fourth? Yeah. My final pick, Donald Trump. Oh, Listen, oh, yeah. We saw it coming. Listen. Everything is over his head, Michael. This guy. I know that, you know, every other podcast in the world is belly aching about him at some point. So let's just join in. And yeah. every fourth episode of ours, we're belly aching about him. I feel it like we be. put him in office with the times we talked about him. Yeah. Uh, this is a... <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> this is a guy who... He didn't. He doesn't want to be president. Everybody no. knows this. Yeah. He wanted to run for president. He wanted to cause a ruckus and start his TV channel with him on there. Yeah. So that he could yell about his own TV channel and not yell about Fox TV. Yeah. He's a seven-year-old man that loves to yell at his TV. That's yeah. what he wants to do. That's his ideal possession. You know, uh, uh, profession. This guy is so unable to hold on to a concept for more than yeah. five minutes, that the last person that he talks to is the one that has his ear. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've been going through a lot of like, we've been going through like various traumas in the country, whether they're, and they're all like self-inflicted yeah, in some part by him, or a lot of them are self-inflicted. But, you know, we just went through this big shooting thing, this big Parkland, Florida shooting, mm-hmm. school shooting thing, and... He's just so off. Like, he's, like, even today, like, we record this a little bit in advance. Like, he had the chance, he has this chance to be sympathetic, but he just, he yeah. just can't be. He, like, yeah. he, he's just physically and mentally incapable of, you know, people start talking about, like, oh, raising the, God, this is depressing. Like, yeah. raising the ages to buy these weapons. Mm-hmm. And it's like, they start to walk it back a week later because yeah. people have gotten in his ear. And it's just like, this pathetic person is the president and like, he doesn't, he, he doesn't want to be there. Nobody wants him there. Yeah, I'm sure that the people that voted for him would like vote for someone else. Mm-hmm. With It doesn't, he, yeah. yeah. It's so depressing. It, it is, yeah. And like, it's a loose-loose. <laughs> and maybe like, this is one of those where like, I feel like in over my head because of him. But you can tell that he, like, this job isn't suited for him. So just, just fucking quit. Yeah. Just quit. And everyone would understand, and they wouldn't care. I do They'd be like, just, okay. There, yeah, well, you, you gave it a shot. I, the first president I got to vote for was Bill Clinton. And there's a component of uh, sociopathy <laughs> that is what it takes to have a political career in which the president is the ultimate accomplishment, at least in the United States, or I guess the world. And you have to have this confidence and this single-minded focus and this pathological liar genetics, and you have to have unshaking uh, charisma. And Clinton had all of those things. And I was glad I voted for Clinton. But there's a part of Clinton that had that narcissism that Trump has, but 
Trump doesn't have, didn't go to Oxford. You know, Trump, tr- Trump wasn't brilliant, brilliant <laughs> you at know, anything. at anything. Except for promoting himself. Yeah. So Trump took a mi- billion dollars and turned it into a million dollars in his, his I career. Do that. career. <laughs> I'd do that in a heartbeat. Yeah. By the way, Jeff, I think in previous episode, you, you would, Said he was somebody who hit a, but yeah, born on third base and act like he hit like a hit a triple, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was somebody who's who, and just the recent thing by saying, I would run into a, a building with a shooter even without a gun. This is a guy who avoided service this guy's, at all costs. Bone say. spurs, yeah. But he like I and I don't know if he he actually thinks these things or just thinks that there's like I don't think he like I bet in, in two weeks from now he won't remember the yeah. things that he said. I do think he's. Like some uh, of the extremely wealthy have lived life without consequence. So the past has never come to bite them in the ass because the past is continually being renegotiated. Well, you know, so much of like his persona is built around him being like a CEO of a company. He's never really been a, a true CEO. He's been the owner of his company. Yeah. And he's beholden to himself and his children, I guess. But like no one, like for a person that has had so many parts of his companies failed and go into bankruptcy. Yeah. Like he would have been kicked out by the board of directors and some yeah. version of it throughout his career multiple, multiple times. Yeah. And I think there's a lot, there's like a weird, like he's put himself on this pedestal of like being like a CEO in that vein. But it's mm-hmm. like, you've never done that. You just had money and then you bought things and then run them into the ground. And yeah. he's now actually accountable to people who vote and the mm-hmm. people that rely on him to some extent and the people that he hires to, you know, work in the White House and do run these government yeah. agencies, you know, like I'm sure that there's even worse Michael Brown type characters on it, you know. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> oh, we'll get to that. I think I know who you're going to get to. But... I don't think you do. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. All right, let's, let's get to him. Yeah. All right. So what's, what is more, what could be kind of got a downer talking about Trump here. Let's yeah, sorry. Think about something a little bit more upbeat. Oh, I know, the Civil War. Oh, sweet. Oh, everyone loves the Civil War, mm-hmm. don't they? Yeah. Uh, Confederate General Gideon Pillow. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Uh, uh, I did not make up that name, guys. This seems I swear like to God, I didn't. The nutty You're character. That, pillow talk. This is not the, the uh, Will Ferrell character in the comedy, the Civil War comedy movie. <laughs> Let's pitch this thing, Jeff. <laughs> this thing's got legs. Um, he was, um, to your point, uh, Michael, he basically was appointed a gen- to be a general, essentially because he helped James Polk uh, win the presidency. He helped run the Democratic National Convention that year and was sort of a behind-the-scenes guy, lawyer type. And so as a thank you, uh, Polk uh, named him as a general. And uh, soon after that, the Mexican-American War started where he quickly um, established his reputation. Is that a good word for it, I think? The Battle of Camargo, where he uh, ordered his troops to dig the, dig a trench mm-hmm. on the fort, which normally is a, a pretty solid tactic. Usually you want to try to dig that trench on the right side of the, the actual fort itself, yeah, not on the outside of the fort. Oh, dear. They dug the trench on the wrong side. On the inside of the fort? Well, yeah, basically. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, so there was no like purpose for no it strategic, whatsoever. Strategic, there's reason. no strategery yeah. happening yeah. on that one, and also bungled the uh, Battle of Cerro Gordo, which I say just because I love the name Cerro mm-hmm. Gordo, and it, at which case he was uh, promoted after wow. this. Uh, then uh, switched sides during during the uh, Civil War to, as a thank you to the U.S. for you know the U.S. Army for for putting up with him. <laughs> Switch sides. <laughs> And managed to bungle things so many places, so right. many times. I love this guy. Yeah, he's uh, a... <laughs> he, uh, before that, he managed to get court-martialed um, because he had, uh, was bragging uh, in a newspaper about battles he had never been in. Mm-hmm. And so he got court- court-martialed and charged, uh, charged with uh, spilling secrets, military secrets. Oh. And he used his get-off-jail-free card being, hey, know the president? I know that guy. I know that guy. So yeah, and he was basically he, he lost a battle where in the Civil War where he was he outnumbered the troops four to one. There's a big battle called Fort Donaldson. who was up against Grant, and Grant had screwed it up, and it should have been something where Pillow could have easily taken the fort, but for whatever reason, he, right at the point where they could have taken the fort, 
he withdrew his troops and then proceeded to run away. Literally just abandoned his mm-hmm. post. Wow. This guy. This guy. Uh, there, we think of like the Civil War generals of like these, you know, the great, the great soldiers, the yeah. great military figures. So many of them were so bad. Yeah. Just because you had, I don't know, maybe it's because you had double the, double the amount of armies. Mm-hmm. So you had to like, it's almost like an expansion draft in like baseball <laughs> or something, right? Yeah. When you thin the talent pool. So okay. you got guys becoming generals and leading troops have no business doing yeah. that. And this, this is what, this is what the, this guy strikes me as. Does, uh, does, does it seem like even within, uh, I guess how, how long was six years? How long was the civil war? Four, four years. Yeah. The, the idea that, uh, military leadership would become a cushy government job by then that you really just didn't have to be that skilled at that you had lieutenants that were doing the real work for you, the real strategic work for you. To some extent. I mean, you had, you had a lot of aides who were that like James Hooker was his, was, was originally his aide during the Mexican American Uh, war who wanted to become a civil war general. So you had these people who were sort of expected to be maybe sort of the, the actual planners, the doers. And again, maybe this is like a, a Michael Brown, Donald Trump type thing Mm -hmm. where it's just sort of like, Oh, I'm going to take this job and I can just sort of be a figurehead and I can just sort of, Lead the troops with my yeah. Your offensive it, coordinator will will do we'll take care of things <laughs> yeah. for you, and, yeah. and it turns out that does not work so well no. in the war. No, no. Outside of the fact that Gideon Pillow sounds like a band that'd be at Coachella, <laughs> this yeah. sounds like an entire failure. Uh, by the way, last thing I, I should work I should say is that after Fort Donaldson, uh, Grant, when he was working out the terms of surrender with the person who was in charge after Pillow fled. Um, said that even if he had captured him, he would have let him go because he would would have done more good for him going back and working for the Confederacy than being captured. I oh, fucking love it. Grant also drank a lot. Um, okay, guys. This was very fun. It was fun to discuss. The Mount Rushmore people who were in way over their heads. Um, there were some really great choices. Some real, some fictional, some real that I wish were fictional. Um, so just because I, th- it was kind of the first guy I thought of, uh, Mike, we get a point for Donald Trump, <laughs> Donald, sorry, Donald fucking Trump. Yeah, please. And, um, I had not heard, um, that story of Gideon pillow. So that was our super fun, uh, choice. Uh, Richard. And, um, I l- have a warm, warm place in my heart for the Hudsucker proxy and really enjoyed that film. And, Carl Lewis and the National Anthem was pretty damn entertaining. And it makes me think maybe I'm not as good at karaoke as I imagine. No, you're I great, am. Jeff. You should try the National Anthem the next time you go to karaoke. How bad could it go? You manipulative bastard. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they need to do. And I'm, I'm the, the first person to sing it has to sing the National Anthem. I'll just leave oh, off. If yeah. Like, yeah, if like, uh, you know, no matter, you know, sh- you get to sing a second one after that. Yeah. But whoever starts karaoke for the night, you have to sing the <laughs> oh, National Anthem. Oh, so and everybody's to salute to the karaoke, karaoke flag. flag. <laughs> or, Do we have to ask if there are any can, Canadians in the you audience? Can, you, can also, you can also protest if you'd like. You know, take a knee. Um, yeah, you have to ask if there's any but then, Canadians. But then, you know, right after you can, you can jump into Dancing Queen. That's fine. Perfect. This has been the Mount Rushmore Podcast. I am always Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Michael.